All right, so I am speaking today again about building effective alliances around the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. I will be talking briefly about what the TPPA actually is, why you should care about it, what some of the problems with it, which is obviously a subset of why you should care about it, what's currently happening in terms of activism, and um, what you might be able to do about it in terms of organising. So to start off with, the Australian government, and specifically the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has defined the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement as a viable pathway for realising the vision of a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. And they've gone on to say that the Australian government is going to pursue a TPP outcome that eliminates or at least substantially reduces barriers to trade and investment. The TPP is more than a traditional trade agreement. It will also deal with behind the border impediments to trade and investment. So this is being framed within the discourse of free trade. The idea is it's going to open barriers to trade, but it's also going to have broader policy implications for other areas, all with the idea of creating better trading relationships and freeing up uh, corporations to work more effectively across borders. Uh, there are currently quite a number of countries that have been involved in the negotiations with varying degrees of commitment. Some of these in the list here are edging away from it, but some of them are more committed. Australia is among the countries that are already very much in the negotiations and the Abbott government thus far seems pretty firmly committed to signing onto the agreement. They've stated in their trade policy that issues which preceding governments considered to be sticking points would not stand in the way of signing the agreement. It will cover issues not only directly related to trade, such as import tariffs, but also broader pol uh, policy areas, including issues related to patents and intellectual property. The text of the TPP is currently a secret. There have been drafts of older texts that have been leaked, um, but the Abbott government has said that there will be no precondition of the text being made public before they sign. Um, in December 2013, the Greens successfully moved a motion with the support of the ALP that the full text should be made available before Australia signed on, and the coalition basically said, no, tough, not going to do it. So why you should care? I'm assuming that if you are listening to this talk, you already kind of realise why you should care, but briefly... The Linux community and FOSS communities more generally are affected by the surrounding legislative environment. There are a lot of things that you can do to work around problematic legislation, um, including just ignoring it or finding tricky little workarounds like not packaging particular software um, with the operating system or whatever it is that you are making available. All of those things make FOSS less accessible and create additional hurdles for non-technical users to jump through. Um, and relying on legislation not being enforced, effect, enforced um, effectively is obviously going to create problems, well, may create problems in the long term. It's not an ideal situation. Uh, the specific critiques related to the TPP Firstly, obviously, there's the lack of transparency. We don't really know what's in the agreement. We can make some pretty good guesses. Um, we have found out very little about the negotiating process. The Defence of Foreign Affairs and Trade site claims that Australia's decision to participate in the TPP in 2008 followed an extensive public consultation process. Um, it's worth critiquing that. <laughs> um, Secondly, there are going to be increasingly restrictive intellectual property um, regimes, for, as far as we can tell, associated with the TPP, kind of building on and expanding stuff we saw with ACTA and previous free trade agreements pushed by the United States. Uh, this could lead to criminalisation of copyright infringement in a more extensive way um, and more restrictions on anti-circumvention rules, among other issues. And there's plenty of good analysis about that, building on what information we do have available. It, you can, for example, look at Kimberly Weatherall's analysis or work from the EFF and other organisations. Related to this, uh, the TPP may also limit the av affordability of access to healthcare by allowing for extended patents over medicines and generally more restrictive intellectual property rules 
that re relate to medicine, such as undermining the Australian and other governments' ability to limit the cost of medicines, which can have knock-on effects for general healthcare policy making as more resources needed to be diverted to paying for medicine. There are also hints that there might be an increased burden on ISPs to monitor intellectual property infringements. And for more on that, you can see analyses by Michael Geist and Sulet Dreyfus. I think there are a few of those online. Uh, I guess at a kind of more fundamental level, there's also um, the inclusion of an investor state dispute settlement mechanism here. Basically, this is an autonomous body which corporations can um, use to sue governments for restricting free trade in some way. Uh, so it's important to remember here that there are a lot of reasons why governments might put restrictions on trade, including to protect citizens' health, the environment, to protect key sectors of the economy, and also labour rights. So, for example, Philip Morris has recently sued the Australian government for requiring plain, pa plain packaging on tobacco, and for this they used an ISDS mechanism that was enshrined in a, a free trade agreement we have with Hong Kong. Um, there are also lots of other examples about this. For example, uh, the Pacific Rim gold mining enterprise is current, um, has recently sued the Salvadorian government because they failed to grant a permit for mining in an area where there had been long-running activism, including several activists being murdered, um, around uh, contaminants, including arsenic, as a runoff from mining. So um, government's attempts to respond to activism from local communities and put restrictions on corporations can then be challenged by corporations and with substantial financial settlements or corporations being able to pu push forward the legislation they want. It's also important to think, uh, to remember that whatever the bad effects on Australia are likely to be, if we think back to the number of countries that are involved in the negotiations, there is lo there's a lot of inequality between the countries involved. The bad effects for Australian citizens will probably be heightened for people living in other countries, developing countries, where not having access to affordable medicine has even greater consequences. For example, impacts on the environment, on health, on labour rights can be far more extreme than what we experience here. So, what can you do? One of the really important aspects of this is just bringing attention to the fact that the TPP exists, is under negotiation, is happening. This is a very uh, rough look at Google Trends. Go and look in more depth if you're interested in that. It shows that there's really only been kind of significant coverage in the last part of 2013. Uh, that has not come from mainstream media pushing the issue themselves, that has come in response to activism. So we can't rely on the mainstream media to cover this, these issues themselves. It's really going to happen under pressure. Um, so one of the important ways of dealing with this at the moment is through the DFAT submissions process. As I said earlier, DFAT is claiming that Australia's decision to participate in the TPP has followed an extensive public consultation process. Uh, they have said that there has been a widespread interest in and support for Australia's participation in the TPP and that input received through the consultation process is being used to inform the government's priorities and objectives for Australia's ongoing work on the TPP. So that's the claim that's being made. If we can disrupt that, that would be really helpful. The submissions to DFAT at the moment um, are all public unless they're specifically requested to be private. They're all available on the DFAT website. The submission process is still open. I think at the moment Bianca Gibson is talking to other people about coordinating a submission on, the behalf, on behalf of Linux Australia, um, which would be great. Uh, and I'm really glad that she's done that, so bonus points to Bianca. Um, it, if you are working with other organisations or through industry groups or anything like that, it would be really helpful if you could also consider putting in, an, in a submission. Um, and if you have expertise to share in creating these kinds of submissions or um, otherwise contributing to them, please see Bianca or coordinate with other people, feel free to talk to me.
Uh, in thinking about the broader activism around these issues, it is also useful to have a bit of an idea of the political landscape nationally that we're working with. So the Greens and the Pirate Party have been pretty active in opposing the TPP and calling for the text to be made public. The ALP has been involved in negotiations around the agreement for the last several years. However, they were always saying that the ISDS, that dispute um, resolution mechanism, was going to be a sticking point. And as I said earlier, they have supported the Greens' calls for the text to be made public before Australia signs on. The Liberals are pretty much fine with the whole thing, have indicated that they're very enthusiastic about going ahead with the process. The Nationals are kind of an interesting one. Um, the decision to have a Liberal rather than a National Minister for Trade um, indicates that the Nationals might be at least a little bit ambivalent and previously they have, um, Barnaby Joyce has said in 2011 that the TPP is unlikely to be good for agriculture. Uh, there's also the, the, the fact that the TPP might limit farmers' ability to prevent fracking on their land uh, might be a sticking point for the nationals, if that can be highlighted. So some of the ways in which we might be able to use that, thinking kind of at the broader strategic level, would be to support the Greens and the Pirate Party's efforts to make the text public before signing and also to raise critiques of the text. We could also think about pushing the ALP to take a stronger stance, uh, particularly with regards to making the text public and when it comes to the dispute resolution mechanism. Um, we can put pressure on the Nationals as well, and I guess on that, the, the coalition between the Liberals and the Nationals around this issue, um, and kind of trying to highlight points of disagreement when it comes to uh, the Nationals' traditional constituency and the likely effects of the TPP. And we can also think about disrupting the Liberals' claims that this is going to be necessarily good for business and that the public is on the side of going ahead with this. Thinking about particular tactics here, I think it is useful to build on previous Linux community activism around um, previous free trade agreements, particularly the free trade agreement that was um, being put together around 2004-2005, which was very imaginatively called the free trade agreement. Um, and I know that Rusty and Kimberly Weatherall and other people um, who are still doing work on this have, were previously active on those issues. I don't want to talk too much about this activism because I wasn't involved in it. I don't know the details of it, although I appreciate Rusty's time in talking me through some aspects of it. Um, it had limited efficacy at the time, although there were some small, um, some small successes, and that's quite possible that that was just because of the political climate they were working with. It's quite possible that there's very little that could have been done to stop uh, that FTA. Um, there are some strategies that were in use then that could probably still be used now, should be used now, and should be expanded on. So, for example, raising awareness within free and open source software communities, seeking support from industry in opposing the TPP. Um, it might be possible to draw on industry, industry's experience of the FTA and similar legislation, similar free trade agreements, that um, how that might have impacted on FOSS over recent years. There's also a lot of really good analysis of the impacts of free trade agreements, especially around copyright and intellectual property that has previously gone on, is still going on. That can be really useful uh, in terms of lobbying and general information uh, um, informational awareness about what's happening and its potential effects. Uh, and then there are the usual respectable means of dissent through the proper channels. So submissions to DFAT, letters to ministers, calls to ministers, petitions, that kind of thing. There are a number of groups with a tech focus that are already working on this issue. So in Australia, there is the Australian Digital Alliance, there is the Pirate Party, the Greens obviously as well. Um, in New Zealand, there is a fair deal. There is Electronic Frontiers Australia, a whole heap of US groups, notably the EFF, um, Linux Australia earlier, as I said earlier. 
Uh, we might also start thinking about broader coalitions and broader networking, branching out beyond the tech community and thinking about the ways in which this can impact on other areas and the usefulness of building coalitions with other groups. So in Australia, some of the groups that are already working on this are the Australian Fair Trade and Investment Network, which has focused on problems with the investor state dispute settlement mechanism um, and also the lack of transparency. There is Choice Australia, which is a consumer group, which has been quite active. They've put together a petition. They've put together an ad that ran in the Australian. They generally support the idea of free trade, but they have raised issues with the fact that the text has not been made public, and they've em emphasised that the agreement needs to be of net benefit to Australians if it is, is to be signed. The Australian Council of Trade Unions has been starting to address this from a labour perspective, but they've also raised concerns around the investor state dispute settlement mechanism and around intellectual property and other issues. The Public Health Association of Australia is obviously focused on health issues, but they see this as encompassing um, the increasingly restrictive intellectual property issues, um, the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, threats to environment and labour protections. Madge Australia do some work around GMOs and food labelling, um, obviously also raising concerns around issues of transparency. There's also some work starting that kind of look, takes a more environmental focus because the TPP is likely to have fairly negative effects on environmental protections. Um, so there's been some analysis from Matthew Rimmer at the ANU there's been some work by the Australian Greens, obviously, and uh, Green Parties in Canada and, the, and New Zealand, and some other activist organisations like Friends of the Earth, although they seem to be more active in the US than in Australia. It would also be useful to think about drawing on a really long history of activism around free trade agreements generally worldwide. Um, there has been a really long history of opposition to these in both the developed and the developing world. One of the most notable highlights of this was the 1999 protests against the Seattle round of the World Trade Organization negotiations. These were really huge. They kind of shut down the city for days, really brought visibility to the impacts of the, the free trade agreements um, and that kind of broader system. Uh, they used a whole range of different strategies, some of which were very theatrical, some of which were more about behind the scenes lobbying and negotiations, um, and they also drew on a really broad range of coalitions. So in terms of thinking through how this might be incorporated into work from the free and open source software community around the TPP, there's quite a few toolboxes out there and books and things like that that kind of run through these strategies that have been developed more broadly among the left and other kind of activist groups. Um, one that I think is quite useful is called Beautiful Trouble. Uh, this is really handy because it covers a wide range of tactics from how to get people to take your leaflets to how to build really creative theatrical pro um, protests that are going to get visibility for your issue. It also explores principles you can use for structuring your activism and your organising and different theories for understanding the issues you're working on, as well as particular case studies, some of which are activism around free trade agreements. Uh, not everything in there is necessarily going to be useful or relevant or advisable, but they're pretty good at kind of pointing out both the benefits and the downsides of different strategies. So just to briefly run through a few that might be useful. One of these is the mapping of a spectrum of allies. So this means actively mapping out who your active supporters are, who, are, who, who is an ally but possibly passive, people who are neutral, and then you know, your actual opponents. And then thinking about how to shift people over to your side. So if there are organisations that are neutral but you think might be convinced, what are the potential ways of convincing them to come a little more into opposition to the TPP? Also, you might think about who is already on your side but who is not active and doing things right now. How can you shift them over into a more active stance? So thinking about the national political structure, there is one potential way to do that. Thinking about other organisations that are already working on these issues is also handy. 
Um, you can also use this to think at an individual level. So who is influential? Who will be able to really get visibility around TPP activism? Um, who is going to be, be in good contact with lots of other people? Who do you have a personal connection to um, that might help you to bring them around? Uh, who already cares about these issues but just hasn't found a space to be active and get things done? Uh, the Overton window can also be useful. So the Overton window is the idea of making sure that there is space for people who have a more radical perspective than your own to shift the view of what might be possible. So at the moment, the mainstream discourse around the TPP is pretty much that it is going to go ahead and it is going to be terrible. Uh, so being active on that and making, giving voice and giving space to people who are talking about shutting down the agreements completely, who are talking about bringing in radical um, provisions into the TPP that might include better labour protections, for example, or better environmental prote protections, things like that, might expand what we think of as possibilities that we can achieve through free trade agreements. Um, and it might be that you end up with a position that is a little more in the centre from the radical position, but you at least open up that discussion a little more. That needs to be done carefully and strategically to avoid pushback, but uh, it's worth thinking about. It's also important to think about building tactics that welcome participation. So one of the important aspects of this is allowing for tiered participation. When you're thinking about building your activism around an issue, consider how you can make sure that everybody who wants to be involved and active can find a way to do that. How can you ensure that a complete newcomer with very little experience can find something to do and at the same time if you get a dedicated ex expert who can only give you a couple of hours or a dedicated expert who wants to quit their job and work on the issue for a couple of months can also find something to do. So, for example, um, if you are thinking about a letter writing campaign, you might on the one hand find somebody who is willing to draft a letter or do the research and then hand it over to somebody else to put together. You might think about um, how somebody can actually sit down and write letters. You might have somebody who can coordinate events at which there are a few speakers and then a few people sit down and write letters, sign them, stuff them into envelopes, send them off. Um, or you might have somebody who can commit to coordinating that entire process and finding a place for other volunteers. You need to think carefully about how you're framing the issue. So do people understand the broad implications of the TPP? Are you framing it in a way that is accessible to your audience? Uh, are you drawing on existing narratives or moral and ethical frameworks that people can relate to? So in the case of the TPP, obviously a really big one here is the idea of transparency and democratic accountability. People who might be comfortable with some of the provisions within the TPP might not be comfortable with the process and the idea that we are undergoing these negotiations without knowing what is in that text. And that can be a sticking point even for groups that support the free trade, the, the general concept of free trade. Um, you also might want to think about how your organisation is structured if you are working through an organisation. Um, are there either explicit or implicit ways in which the structure of your organisation means that a few people end up doing lots of the work and potentially get burnt out? and other people who want to be involved aren't really finding a pathway to do that, aren't getting the mentoring they need, aren't having the autonomy or feeling empowered to run, coordination, uh, to run campaigns or to run the activities that they would do that would help to get action on these issues. And obviously that relates to my final point as well, which I think always needs to be emphasised when it comes to activist work. It's important to think about avoiding burnout, um, how to ensure that you are decentralising work as much as possible, taking the time for self-care when you need to, um, and also recognising the limitations of what we can achieve on this, and so not getting too disheartened when we do not completely and utterly revise international copyright, intellectual property law, labour and environmental, etc. Um, so. Other things to think about are direct action. So up until now, I've mostly been talking about issues that are fairly respectable means of dissent. 
submissions, petitions, letter writing, calling your MP, that kind of thing. Um, and this is obviously something that fits more with a industry-based approach to campaigning. However, direct action also has a place um, in terms of the Seattle um, uh, the Seattle protests against the WTO negotiations, direct action was very effective in gaining visibility for something that had previously mostly taken place behind closed doors with very little media attention. So the idea of direct action is that you, rather than asking governments or other targets to please make the changes you would like to see, you go ahead and make them yourself immediately. So in the case of the Seattle protests, they were saying, what we would like to see is the negotiations shut down. And then what they literally did was surround the space where the negotiations were taking place in order to shut them down in a literal and physical sense. Um, and that kind of led to a three-day um, media spectacle, I guess you can say, um, massive police repression as well, uh, where I think it was by the end of the second day, the police chief had sent someone on a personal mission to another state to go get some more pepper spray because they had used all of theirs. Um, obviously, there are risks involved in that. In terms of the TPP, if you're thinking about direct action, there are two kind of major demands that are being made around the TPP. One of them is to make the negotiations visible or shut them down. Um, and another one is to make the text visible and openly available. Um, there are various ways in which you might think about going about direct action on those issues. Obviously, these come with risks as well, and it's important to think about those, particularly in relation to burnout and the impacts on activists of doing activism. Uh, another really important thing when we're thinking about free trade negotiations is to think about how we might stick a crowbar in international divisions and how those might become uh, important and relevant and can be used in our activism. So I mentioned that there was a vast inequality between different organizations, uh, different countries that are involved in the negotiations. Uh, some of the analysis that's coming out is really highlighting this and highlighting that there are important areas of disagreement between the US and even its traditional partners and supporters. Um, there was quite a good article on this by Henry Farrell and also drawing on research by Gabriel Michael, um, analysis of the previous leaked texts. Um, what we can do with that is draw on the work by um, organizations in the US and in other places. Uh, think about how we can bring more visibility to the critiques being raised by other nations. So, you know, make it clear that if Malaysia doesn't want to sign on to this deal or if Canada isn't comfortable with particular copyright provisions, maybe that's something that Australia should be thinking about as well. We can also provide support to civil society, nonprofit organizations, activist organizations in other countries to put pressure on their governments not to sign, to put pressure on their governments to highlight some of the problems uh, with the text as it is. Um, and I think that kind of covers the main things I wanted to go through today. I am now open to questions, or I could retell some of the best questions from the previous session. Yeah. Yeah, just to go back to the last slide. Uh huh. I'm not a not across a lot of the detail, but I stumbled across an article fairly recently where someone had done a lot of um, text analysis and some of the stuff that was leaked and little visualization stuff. And yeah. They clumped up all the countries that were sort of talking to each other, and often it was the U.S. and then most of the rest. And yet it seems all the bad stuff. Well, I mean, that is mostly because of the inequality of the international system. M many countries have signed on to free trade agreements that are not necessarily all that beneficial to them because the US is an important trading partner and they're willing to sign on to some things that are not so great so that they can stay in competition with other countries in terms of having, their, having the US as a market. So They, they might still decide that the costs of not signing on are going to outweigh 
the costs of signing on, particularly when it comes to countries who have a very unequal relationship with the US, sadly. Anything else? Yeah? Within Australia, um, who are the uh, active uh, opposition? Uh, to the TPP? Um, um, the Liberal Party is, some sectors of industry do support it as well, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, there, were, there were a couple of really good points raised in the question session from last time. So somebody asked whether there's any point doing this kind of activism, um, and I would say that Yes, because it changes the political system we, we live within if people can see what's going on, if they're more aware of what's going on and they think of free trade agreements as something we need to be paying attention to. Um, and Dave Cake from the Electronic Frontiers Australia also pointed out that one of the reasons why these, these provisions are being pushed through in free trade agreements is because attempts to push more restrictive copyright regimes, intellectual property, property regimes through in national legislation were met with significant enough opposition that they didn't go through. And so that's, that's why people are using international, uh, international agreements behind closed doors instead. So in, in some ways, the fact that these terrible things are happening through free trade agreements rather than through national legislation is a sign of the, the benefits of activism. Maybe? Yeah. Yes. Do we know if Uh, I'm not aware. I, I don't know if there's any information about that at the moment. It's just kind of been said industry. So I, I would be very interested to know more about that as well. Yeah. And who was involved in that extensive public consultation process? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. I know that there, I mean, the Greens have been speaking in Parliament about this and there have been submissions to DFAT already um, and there's definitely coverage in the media by academics that are looking in more technical detail, including quite a bit on the conversation. Um, in terms of lobbying directly to senators, I don't know if that's happening. Um, and if it's not, it should be. Yeah? yeah um the spectrum of allies? Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems then, I'm going to use the replaceable because that's where I started for Twitter. Mm -hmm. You look at the level of um, intellect, intellect for want of a better word, a large number of people just don't care or just sort of glaze over all they care about is their Twitter handle or that their cat did something stupid. And before the election, I was posting this stuff from the Bar Party and no one hardly looked, you know, there's no comment. If I've got 130 people and 95% of them just don't give a rat, how do you even start with that sort of yeah. demographic? Wipe them away in 84 and troll them, you know what I mean? Well, I think that Facebook's actually very interesting because on Twitter you tend to, or at least for me, on Twitter I tend to interact with people who are already interested in the kinds of things I am interested in politically. On Facebook you tend to have a lot of loose connections that you have brought in um, through other ways and the fact that you are interacting with people who mostly post about their footy teams or whatever else it is that you might find un interesting is actually really important and useful because you're not preaching to the converted. You are talking to people who are not already active and then it takes some effort to think about how to frame those issues in a way that other people are willing to take them up and are interested in them. And one of the ways to do that is to use more accessible language, to respect, respect your audience as well, respect that the people you're talking to um, might not be exposed to the same information as you and they might need you to just 
find the right hook in. So um, think, as, as I said earlier, think about your framing. Think about talking about democracy, for example, or transparency or accountability. I think another really good way to do that is to always try, if you're telling someone terrible news about how awful the world is, try to always link it to a specific action that's doable. Don't just say there's this huge, big, scary free trade agreement and it's terrible. Say, if you care about this and if you care about democracy and if you want to be active, here's a petition you can sign or please take the time to share this or something like that. Make it seem like there is a reason to know that information and something you can actually do with it other than be horrified. As somebody whose Facebook stream is almost a constant stream of propaganda, um, yeah, I, if you experiment with it a little more, sometimes you can yeah. make headway. are organizations doing that on different issues and often that kind of thing is a little risky to put online because then I'm um, depending on what issues you're active on you might not want that to be visible um, in terms of the TPP I'm sure there are I'm if even if you look at the Australian Digital Alliances website though you kind of have their supporters on there um, keeping a database of voting positions for different um, representatives can also be helpful, and I think that that's happening on different issues. I, I know in the UK they have one. They have one here. You can find what people have been voting on, and you might be able to find potential leverage points there. Um, yeah, uh, there's been a couple of people who presented on that kind of thing at Linux conference as well, who I can maybe link you to if you're interested. Uh, anything else? All right, maybe we will finish up then. All right.